just so people know, there's a whole range of, uh, let me give an incredibly condensed history um, of Israel and the US um, in Palestine and the Middle East. There's a whole range of books out on the literature table, um, books produced by Haymarket Books and other publishers um, about the Middle East, about Palestine. Um, one of them I want to point people to is Gaza in Crisis, Reflections on Israel's War Against the Palestinians, um, co-written by Noam Chomsky and Alain Pape, who is actually an Israeli who left Israel um, in opposition to what they were doing, and is written very truthfully um, about what's going on there. So our final speaker tonight um, is Mustafa Omar. He is... He's an Egyptian-American activist who's lived here in the States for the past 18 years. He's a contributing author to another wonderful book that I'd recommend called The Struggle for Palestine, which is a series of essays that could go through the history of the U.S.-Israeli relationship and the struggle for self-determination in the Middle East. So please welcome this offer. Thank you. I want to thank the audience. I'm inspired by the size of the audience. I'm inspired by the analysis, the passion that came from the panel. And I would actually like to specifically thank Lamis, my Palestinian sister. Uh, I would not be here today if it was not for the Palestinian Intifada of 1987. I was a very depressed teenager. <laughs> the Palestinian Intifada gave us hope, gave me hope like it gave millions of Arabs uh, who were living in very dark times, gave us hope. And that's why I'm here. And I promise you, thousands of people in the streets in Egypt are also there because they've been inspired by the Palestinians. So thank you, Lamis. <laughs> As you, heard, as you heard from the organizers of this event, uh, the administration of this university and other universities think that Arabs and Muslims are a security risk. Yes. I want to assure this administration that I'm not a security risk, <laughs> nor have I ever supported any terrorism or any terrorist attacks. And while the speakers were speaking, I drafted a list of five things, five terrible, terrible, heinous acts that I have never supported. <laughs> Brothers and sisters have never supported the American invasion of Iraq in 1991 and 2003. For those of you who are old enough and for those of you who are reading, I have never supported the deadly sanctions against the people of Iraq that cost one million lives in the 1990s. I've never supported Israel's 60-year brutal oppression of the Palestinian people. Dear administration, <laughs> unlike your friends in the White House and in the State Department and the CIA, which recruits on this campus, I have never supported tyrannical dictatorships in Egypt, Tunisia, or Saudi Arabia, where women cannot drive a car, where the poor get their hand cut if they dare to steal a loaf of bread. I have never done that. And finally, dear administrators, I have never, ever taken part in any research and development program in your respectful establishment to help the Pentagon produce the tear gas banisters and concussion grenades that the Pentagon and our government has given to President Mubarak freely to use against the protesters in Cairo, Suez, and Alexandria. I have never done that. Finally, dear administrators, I said I have never supported these brutal crimes. Your own government did and still does. I am simply a supporter of the democratic struggles of the millions of the poor and the workers in Tunisia and Egypt and in the rest of the Arab world. Our struggle to control our own destiny. Sorry. Our struggle to benefit, finally, from the oil that we have been producing for decades benefit from the labor that we have been um, carrying out for many decades. I'm a supporter, and that's why I'm a supporter of the revolutions underway in Egypt and Tunisia and hopefully in the rest of the Arab world. Dear administrators, if you have a problem with these terms that I've used, terms like control our own destiny, enjoy the fruits of our labor, live in a society based on freedom but also social justice, please try to Google Translate. Maybe you will get it. <laughs> now that's as far as the administration is concerned. Yesterday in Egypt it was 
a great day for the protesters in Egypt. <coughs> Tomorrow, the day to honor our 300 martyrs will also probably be a great day of mass solidarity and massive demonstrations. But, brothers and sisters, not every day in a revolution will be a great and beautiful day. There will be days when revolutions suffer casualties, tens, maybe hundreds of injuries, and also setbacks. And that is to be expected, as horrible as it is, that is to be expected because no entrenched ruling class in the history of the world has given up on its power, has given up on the stolen wealth, has given up on the unearned privileges that they have enjoyed for decades without attempting, maybe one last time, maybe one more last time, to stop those who are trying to end a brutal regime. That is to be expected. And that's what we saw on Wednesday and Thursday of last week, when a Mubarak regime sent the security officers in plain clothes to terrorize the protesters on horses, camels, using machetes, knives, and rocks. It was a rough battle. It was a bloody battle. Six were killed, and a thousand people were injured. But the protesters, through tremendous courage, held their ground for 16 hours. <laughs> Last night, I spoke to a friend of mine, Ahmed Chalki, who also is the editor of the International Socialist Review, who will be back in a week or so, and is looking forward to speaking to all of you. He told me that our friends on the left, the progressives and even the revolutionary socialists, went home that night, the night of Wednesday night, feeling beaten, exhausted, and actually everybody broke down and cried. But something happened that night also. On Friday morning, the anger at the government's attacks on peaceful protesters, but more importantly, the fact that millions of e people around Egypt watched the courage of the protesters in Tahrir Square, how they were willing to make a sacrifice after sacrifice, gave the rest of the country more determination to come out on Friday it was the largest demonstration all week of millions of people around the country. And that night, 500,000 people slept in Tahrir Square, the largest number of people who slept in the square since the beginning of the revolution. <laughs> Friday was a turning point, really, for the pro-democracy movement in a number of ways. First, the protesters' level of politics and organizing really matured and developed significantly. You can say actually qualitatively. In Tahrir and Alexandria, and I want to give you a couple of examples, the protesters decided that it is not enough to shout or demand the regime must fall or Mubarak must fall or Mubarak's regime must fall. They actually drafted a seven-point program that they wrote on a massive uh, uh, billboard across Tahrir Square and across different squares in Alexandria and said that we will not go home unless those seven demands, not just one demand, will be met. The president must resign, the parliament must be dissolved, the, uh, a new committee to draft a new constitution, the immediate lifting of all emergency laws that have been in place for more or less 60 years, and the final two demands, I think, were the beginning of an immediate trial of all those who were responsible for the murder of all the peaceful protesters, and the final one, the beginning of immediate trials of all those rich people who have robbed the country blind. <laughs> and that was a significant development, because people realized but they have to actually articulate concrete demands, not just general slogans of the regime must go, and fight for those demands. The second significant development really out of Friday is that people realize it's not enough to just hold Tahrir Square. We need to be more organized, and we actually need to be organized in a democratic way. And the impetus for that move was the fact that they saw that people like Mohammed al-Baradai, the reformer, other billionaires actually, 
uh, and constitutional lawyers have formed a committee called the Committee of the Wise Men, and they claim to speak in the name of the people. So people realize that this is a very dangerous situation. Those elites are trying to find a way out of the regime, too. Are trying to get rid of Mubarak, maybe gradually, but save the entire social and economic system. So the protesters realize that they also must form their own organizing committees to not only articulate those demands, but they said, no one speaks in the name of the protesters, the pro-democracy movement. It has to be a democratic process, and you are not allowed to negotiate with the regime unless Mubarak leaves. The same thing happened in Alexandria, and hopefully this kind of grassroots organizing that took place in Tahrir Square and Alexandria will begin to spread to other parts of the country, and hopefully people will also coordinate between different cities, between Cairo, Alexandria, and Mansoura. The few days, the days to come, will show which way things will unfold. But I wanted to say a few words about the nature of the pro-democracy movement. Uh, because, uh, you know, in the media here, they're always trying to scare us that it's going to be an Islamic fundamentalist movement and so on and so forth. First of all, it is up to the Egyptian people to decide what kind of society they want to live in. If they want... And I guarantee you, and I'm not a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood, I'm a socialist, a Muslim Brotherhood government will not be as brutal as the government of Hosni Mubarak of the last 30 years. Because the Egyptian people will not tolerate it. But having said that, the movement has actually developed in a very serious way along the demands of a secular, democratic, pluralistic society. And that is very significant. The Egyptian people are probably one of the most religious people in the Arab world. And they have tremendous respect for the Muslim Brotherhood, and they are the largest political party in the country. But the majority of the young people in the squares in Cairo and Alexandria want a true democracy, want equality for our Christian brothers and sisters, and do not want an Islamic state. And that is very important. I give you a small example from Alexandria yesterday, where you might see the crowds of people always stopping the protest, taking a break, and praying. Yesterday in Alexandria, during the Friday prayer, the Muslim Brotherhood actually try to separate themselves from the rest of the crowd during the Friday prayer. Everybody stopped that, uh, their prayer. Actually, they started booing them and said, why do you think you know, you're better than us? So actually, they don't like that kind of fundamentalism that actually separates one Muslim against another, but also discriminates against Christians. And they had to back down, and they had a unified prayer. <laughs> another example from Cairo yesterday. Even most of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, speakers and all those protests have actually been advocating democracy. There's no talk about an Islamic state. I think we are past that stage in terms of the development of the movement in Egypt. But one of their speakers got up and actually uh, proposed an Islamic state. Thousands and tens of thousands booed him down and the Muslim Brotherhood had to apologize. So it's very important. I bring these two small examples. It's very important for us to understand the nature of the movement uh, that is unfolding in Cairo. It's a movement for democracy, for a society based on civil institutions with equality between Muslims and Christians. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, the Muslims and the Christians are part of those demonstrations on a daily basis. The second thing, it's a festival on those streets, in those squares. Singers have been coming down to Tahrir Square with national songs and radical songs. Thousands are singing along with them. Poets are pouring their hearts out against the regime and for a better future. You can actually listen to that on Al Jazeera even if you don't understand Arabic. Comedians from everywhere are pouring into Tahrir Square to let the steam out for the people who have been actually suffering for so many. It's, it's a beautiful scene. It is not just a, a, a protest uh, 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 for the... It's a really a, a festival. What, um, maybe a hundred years ago, I don't know, uh, the Russian revolutionary Lenin said, uh, cold revolutions, a festival of the oppressed. When the oppressed finally shed all the shackles of the past and begin to feel once again as human beings. They want to talk not just about politics and history, they want to sing, they want to hear poetry, they want to learn how to read or write if they're illiterate. That is exactly what's happening on the streets in Tunisia and in Egypt. People who are literate and illiterate are becoming very aware becoming more sophisticated than the regime's elites with all their Oxford and Harvard PhDs. <laughs> Ahdaf Suave, some of you might know her, the well-known Egyptian novelist, 
But she's not just a novelist, she's a brave activist, has been in Tahrir Square for 12 days, was talking today on Democracy Now! And she said every time she goes to Tahrir Square, she cannot walk more than three or four meters before a group of five or 10 or 20 recognize her and stop her and they want to discuss politics, history, and art. So that's how she described it on Democracy Now! Small groups, big groups are actually feeling liberated and they want to learn what the hell is this constitution? What about the Palestinian issue? Amazing debates going on and a truly democratic movement unfolding. And a very important thing on the role of women. Women have been a key part, not only of this uh, 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 revolution in the past 12 days. The country was rocked by a wave of strikes in the last six years. Millions of women have entered the workforce in the last 10 or 20 years because of the economic crisis. Millions of Egyptian working class women work in sweatshops everywhere in the country. That wave of strike that rocked the Mubarak regime, and I would argue began to break down that barrier of fear. Women played a key role throughout those years. It was the women of Al Mahal al Kubra which is an industrial city in the Delta. And I do remember that it was a general strike in that city, I think it was the year 2006, that walked out of the factories first and challenged the men by chanting, where we here are the women, where are the men? The men felt absolutely embarrassed and it became a general strike. They joined the women. <laughs> Veiled women are probably those who are members of the working class are probably some of the most militant people in this country for the past five or six years. Don't underestimate that. And they are leading the chance in Tahrir Square. I say this because uh, I watched an amazing interview. Actually, it was not an interview. It was a YouTube broadcast from this woman called Asma Mahfouz. And please get the spelling from me afterwards. Asma Mahfouz is, uh, I think, 23, 24 old young woman, a veiled woman. Um, she actually is the one who issued the January 18 call on YouTube for the January 25 protest. Watch that uh, call. It is brilliant and it's actually translated now. You can watch it on Democracy Now! But what she said actually on January 26, I believe, on the second day of the protest, after she went home, she spoke passionately about the day of events, about the you know, hundreds of thousands of people at Tahrir Square, but she said something absolutely important. She said, this is the first time in my life, I'm an Egyptian woman who has lived in Egypt all my life, oppressed. First time in my life, I was not sexually harassed in a public square. The thousands of men in that square treated me, treated me like a human being. And don't underestimate that statement when you watch the video because you cannot walk anywhere before, you know, the events of the last few weeks in the streets of Cairo as a woman without being sexually harassed time and time again without any protection from the state. She said, I can feel that the men, my brothers, are beginning to change and are taking me seriously. And that is a very significant development. So you have a movement of Christians and Muslims, men and women, young and old, workers, employed and unemployed, and uh, it is only the beginning at a, and, and hopefully it will develop in a serious way. I bring up the Christians issue because it's a very significant issue because Christians are 15% of the population that are an oppressed minority and the government tried desperately through, uh, uh, to, to actually tell Christians that this is going to be an Islamic state, you have to support Mubarak. The Pope, the Coptic Pope of Egypt, who was a supporter of the government, issued a call to all Christians not to join the protest. In the last few days, the number of Christian workers, not only intellectuals and leftists, that have been actually joining the demonstrations on the increase. Tomorrow, it is Sunday. Like I said, it's going to be the day of the martyrs to honor the martyrs. There will be an Islamic Friday prayer for the martyrs side by side with the Sunday Christian mass to honor the martyrs. This is unprecedented in Egyptian history in the last 90 years. I want to finish. That's, that's I, I, I just two minutes to finish and I tried to give you a flavor of what things might look like on the ground. I hope I did a little bit, but I want to just end by saying that the future of the Egyptian revolution is going to be uh, the key for the future of what happens in Tunisia. Tunisia inspired Egypt, but the future of the Egyptian revolution will also determine what happens in Tunisia. And I encourage comrades here in this room to read more about the unfolding events in Tunisia where the workers are actually beginning to take over the factories abandoned by the cronies of the old regime and things are moving very fast.
I don't want to be an Arab chauvinist. We used to always uh, fight with the Tunisian, not me, but the Tunisian soccer fans in the streets. But now Egyptians and Tunisians are best friends in the world. And the Tunisian flag is everywhere in uh, Egypt. I say this, not only Tunisia, but the future of the beginning of protest movement in places like Jordan, where the government fell, and Yemen, where the president is beginning to make concessions. With the, which way Egypt goes will actually be absolutely key. Which way uh, the future for those protest movements, will they continue? Will, will they also develop into revolutionary movement? Uh, because Egypt has been and still is the largest and most important Arab country economically, politically, and militarily. It has been the case for a century or so that millions of the Arabs, millions of Arab poor workers and students have always looked to Egypt for inspiration. Uh, I don't want to get into the reasons for that, but I will tell you something, a victorious social revolution in Egypt, and I'm not predicting that that will happen in the next few days or few weeks. It might actually unfold over the course of the next few months. If it wins, a few things I think you should be rest assured will take place. The first thing, of course, the end of the Mubarak regime. The second thing I think will be for the first time in the last 60 years, the Egyptian people will be able finally to provide real material support to our Palestinian brothers and sisters. The first thing we will do is we will end the siege of the Gaza Strip. Um, and the last thing, there's so many things that the Egyptian revolution will do besides giving uh, tremendous inspiration, obviously, to all the protest movements across the Arab world. It will do something more significant. It will be, or overall, it will change the balance of forces as one of the speakers said, in the entire Middle East. It will go from a Middle East that has been under the control of the United States, under the control uh, of the United States in the e since the end of World War II. A Middle East with dictators in Saudi Arabia and uh, Kuwait and Egypt and Algeria. As Professor Khalidi said today, nowhere else in the world you have that accumulation of such miserable dictators. The balance of power actually given a victorious Egyptian revolution could change. You could see the toppling of regimes in Yemen, in Egypt, in Tunisia, and, and Morocco. And believe it or not, there are millions of poor people in the richest country in the Middle East, that is Saudi Arabia, and the government are shitting in their pants. So I'm sorry about that. But and the Middle East, as we know it, controlled by American imperial uh, 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 how do you say? Far reach? Outreach? I don't know. Uh, will, huh? Power. <laughs> could, could, and I'm not trying to actually sound triumphless. Could, and it's only a possibility depending on the outcome in the Middle East, could begin to change. It could be the beginning of a serious defeat for U.S. imperialism in the Middle East. And I think the Obama administration, the Obama administration, trying to ease Mubarak out, understand that things have changed forever. And they're trying to prepare themselves to deal and uh, with the regimes that will follow the Mubarak regime, or the Saleh regime, or the Ben Ali regimes. Um, and I hope we will actually be able to build a movement in which we will have regimes that will continue to change that balance of power. The final two things I want to say is that someone said on Democracy Now! today, a new Middle East is possible. Yes, a new Middle East is possible, but it can never win. We can get rid of dictators in the Middle East. We can get rid of Mubarak. You can get rid of Ben Ali. You can actually begin to actually even build truly democratic societies. We will never win, we will never rest assured that our victories will be lasting victories until we have real change in Europe and especially in the United States of America. And therefore, and this is not just wishful thinking, as a number of the speakers before, the United States might tolerate a democratic re revolution in Egypt. If it spreads, rest assured that the United States will do its best, including military intervention, to defeat those revolutions. And therefore, we don't want just to have solidarity with the Egyptian people because the revolution is great and here we want to have solidarity. If they win, they will weaken American imperialism. Our job here, I think, is to build a movement that will finish it off and prevent it from actually uh, uh, stopping the historical process that is probably underway. So we want to say another Middle East is possible and that is very important because another world is possible and every single person in this room can make it that happen.